All right, everybody, welcome. We're going to get started as soon as we give a few minutes for people to join the webinar. If you're just joining, welcome. We are currently just letting a few minutes pass so people can join the webinar. We haven't had anybody else join in a minute, so maybe we should get started. Okay. All right, everybody. Welcome to the webinar that serves as a question and answer session, as well as just an information session about psychology and cognitive science programs at University of California, Davis. Congratulations on your admission. I'm glad you're considering UC Davis, and we are really excited to hear what kind of questions you have. Um, but first, let's get started by talking a little bit more about these majors. Um, and we're going to introduce ourselves first, though. My name is Stacy Jenkins, and I am an academic advisor for psychology and cognitive science. Um, I actually got my bachelor's degree in psychology with minors in English and communication from Chico State, and I got a master's degree in education from University of the Pacific. I've been at UC Davis since 2017, and a fun fact about me is that I have three cats who are currently asleep behind me, and I've named them after Twilight characters, so there you go. <laughs> Hello everybody, my name is Rachel Hale. I'm one of the psychology and cognitive science advisors at UC Davis. Um, I actually was a transfer student myself. I transferred from Solano Community College and majored in history at UC Davis. I am alone i think you were cutting out there a bit rachel did you want to repeat that last few um parts what point did i cut out um, in, the middle. in the middle yeah okay did you hear me say that i went to uc davis yes okay yeah. transfer student from solano okay so yes, went to UC Davis, majored in German and history. Um, I've been a staff member for 16 years now, so it's been a while. And I got Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Kristen. I'm also one of the staff advisors for the psychology and cognitive science department. 
Uh, I graduated from UC Davis last year with a Bachelor of Science in Psychology with a bio emphasis and a Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy um, with a pre-med emphasis. Uh, fun fact about me, I like to play video games in my spare time and I've recently been super into Animal Crossing. So if you play that, it's fun. Okay, so I'm going to have uh, two of our other panelists introduce themselves. We have two current students in psychology who are joining us to help us answer questions. So go ahead. Okay, hi, my name is Megan. Um, I'm a current senior here at UC Davis. I'm studying psychology with a biology emphasis with a minor in communications. And I'm actually planning to go to occupational therapy school in the fall. So that's me. Uh, hi everybody, my name is Daisy. I'm also a senior, but I'm going to be staying an extra year. Um, I'm a psychology and organizational sociology double major. Um, and I'm thinking about going into uh, policy and stuff like that. So, yay. All right, thank you. Okay, so as we get started, feel free to begin asking questions in the Q&A area, and we have a lot of time reserved at the end to address them. All right, Kristen, go ahead. So over the next few minutes, um, we're going to just talk a little bit more about requirements in the psychology and cognitive science majors. Um, we do wanna show you a video uh, that is a tour of one of our labs from a neuroendocrinology instructor that we have. So basically you're going to learn more about joining research teams while here at UC Davis. And then um, we'll have lots of time for your questions. So we tried to anticipate some of your questions ahead of time and we think that maybe you want more information about what kind of classes you will be required to take um, and what kinds of careers can be an outcome of having a degree in psychology or cognitive science. And so that's just what this front part of information is going to consist of and I'm sure we'll delve more deeply um, with your own questions. So in psychology, we have three different majors. We have an AB, which is the same thing as a Bachelor of Arts. It's just an abbreviation for the Latin form of Bachelor of Arts. And the Bachelor of Arts in psychology is a more generalized way of studying psychology. Um, we have four areas of psychology that our faculty at UC Davis really specialize in. And so the idea for the generalized Bachelor of Arts is for students to have the ability to pick and choose the areas of psychology that they want to take more classes in. So those areas are cognitive and neuroscience psychology. We have biological psychology social and personality psychology, and developmental psychology or lifespan psychology. We also have another area that our faculty specialize in and that's quantitative psychology. Um, although um, much of those really specialized quantitative classes are at the grad level. Um, but we do have a quantitative emphasis as a bachelor's of science in psychology. And that is a really cool combination of psychology and statistics. For the biological emphasis in psychology, which is another bachelor of science, that option is a combination of biological sciences and psychology. So for each of the BS, programs that we have. Uh, those you can expect to have more STEM or science and math requirements such as calculus, physics, chemistry, and biology. For the cognitive science degrees, 
We also have three. The first I'll discuss is the AB or the Bachelor of Arts. This too is a more generalized approach to learning about cognitive science. This is an opportunity for students to pick and choose the areas of cognitive science that appeals to them. And cognitive science is a pretty cool interdisciplinary major that really blends a few disciplines together in order to understand the mind in a slightly different way than psychology. So those disciplines together that make cognitive science are psychology, linguistics, computer science, neuroscience, and philosophy. We have two BS options in cognitive science as well. One is the neuroscience option, and that is a blend between many different brain science courses, including neuro neuroscience courses, psychology courses, and biology courses. And then the computational emphasis is another BS, and that is a combination of more of a computer science curriculum blended with your choice of other courses from the cognitive science disciplines. I'm ready to move on, Kristen. All right. So here on this slide, there are pictures of handouts that we're going to make available to you online. Um, and these are, these handouts have information about sample courses that you would be taking in the major or that you have an option to take in the major, as well as some sample careers that our graduates in these majors have gone on to pursue. So some sample courses in psychology would be developmental psychology or Developmental disorders, abnormal psychology, there's personality psychology, psychology of emotion, psychology of gender and reproduction, cognitive psychology, um, cognitive neuroscience. So these are some sample courses from each of the specialties of psychology that our faculty focus in. You can also find a full list of our classes on the UC Davis catalog. Depending on the emphasis that you choose in psychology, you would be required to take more of one category than the other. For example, if you are a biological emphasis psychology student, you would be taking more of the biological psychology courses for that program. Some of the common careers that you might consider um, after earning a degree in psychology would be anything in the clinical realm, which might be therapy or direct counseling, like being a psychologist. Many students are interested in medical school, which could be psychiatry or something more generalized in medicine like an MD or physician's assistant or nursing. There's also a lot of areas in business that psychology can relate to. Um, and then there's other areas like law and the technical field. And it just depends on where your interests and skills in psychology may be. Stacy, I'm sorry, I'm just going to interrupt for a second. Um, yeah. we, we know that the slides are really hard to read. We're sorry but we will be posting them online at the end. Um, I've had several people tell me the slides are hard to read. Okay. Um, so in cognitive science, some sample courses would be cognitive psychology or cognitive neuroscience, perception, human memory. Um, sample philosophy classes in that area would be philosophy of mind or the philosophy of knowledge, uh, philosophy of science, those types of courses that really are a philosophical background of knowledge and the mind. 
Um, some computer science classes that are related to cognitive science would be machine learning and artificial intelligence, basic coding and programming courses, and then some neuroscience courses um, would be more uh, similar to the biological psychology courses, um, which would be like biological psychology. There are more classes listed on the worksheet that we will make available to you. So I know it's a little blurry, like Rachel said. So some careers that cognitive science could result in might be, again, direct care and health, like going into the medical field or going into therapy or counseling. Um, there's also a lot of areas that are related to the tech field, especially as it relates to artificial intelligence, user experience, and machine learning. And then in the business world, um, because you're learning about the mind and behavior, it has some of the same applications as somebody coming out with psychology. One unique area of cognitive science uh, is its connection to linguistics. And so if that's an area of, of cognitive science that really interests you, that could result in careers in speech language pathology, audiology, things like that. All right, Kristen, thanks. So um, we're going to show a five minute video tour of one of the labs in psychology. We have over 50 labs just from psychology faculty alone, um, but we have a lot of other research opportunities outside of our own department that psychology and cognitive science students might be interested in. So while undergraduate students are not by any means required to be involved in research, I do understand that a lot of students come to UC Davis looking for that experience, especially if you have grad school on the horizon. So this is just a little bit of a taste of what you can to look or what you have to look forward to and how to begin that process of engaging in research. If the video is um, having some connection issues, like if it's blurry, like some of the slides, um, hang with it, but the video itself is also going to be made available to you afterwards. Go ahead, Kristen. Come on in. Yeah, have a seat. Excited? Yeah, you did really well in your interview last week. We're excited to have you join the group. Do you want to see what we did with uh, our social anxiety research program last week? Check it out. This is a video of the social interaction test that we use in most of our studies. There's a mouse in this cage here, and you can see our test mouse is really interested in it. See how she's getting right up close to the cage? This is pretty typical in mice. If they come across a mouse they don't know, they want to check it out. Now, look at this mouse. See how she's staying back? She's not approaching the cage, but she's paying attention to it at the same time. We measure how much time the mouse is sort of watching the cage, and we call that social vigilance. This behavior is interesting because developmental psychologists see a very similar combination of avoidance and vigilance sometimes in children. They call it behavioral inhibition, and it's one of the biggest risk factors for developing an anxiety problem later in life. So in humans, we can take a brain scan and see what parts of the brain are active when a person is feeling anxious, but we can't see what individual cells are doing. We can do that in mice. Today, you're gonna to see why that's important. Let's go up into the lab. Remember our new lab member? Yeah. Can you take it from here? Sure thing. Okay. So welcome. Today we're looking at brain tissue that has been stained for individual neurons associated with social vigilance behavior. But before we can have you start helping out, we have to make sure you're wearing all of your personal protective equipment. 
So the first thing you're gonna need is a lab coat, pair of gloves, can't forget the eye protection, and a bike helmet. I'm just kidding on that one. So come on in. We're gonna be looking at brain tissue that has been stained for oxytocin producing neurons. Now oxytocin is a hormone that has gotten a lot of buzz recently for being associated with good feelings like love, social interaction, and parenting behavior. But oxytocin can actually work to increase anxiety in some circumstances. We're trying to figure out why that is. Our main hypothesis is that oxytocin is working in some regions of the brain to help promote those feel-good feelings, but working in other regions of the brain to actually promote anxiety behaviors. So why don't you take a seat and we can talk about this a little bit more. Here we're looking at slices of brain tissue that are being incubated in an antibody that binds to oxytocin. The antibody has fluorescent molecules in it that allow us to see which neurons are producing oxytocin. So once we've finished staining the brain tissue, we mount it into the glass slides and then we can look at it under the microscope. How about we have you come take a look yourself? All right, and it's this way. Hey, Kay. Hey, this is our new undergrad. I was hoping you could show them some of the brains we had previously stained with the oxytocin antibody. Of course, come on in. So in order to see the stains we apply, we need to shine a special light onto the slides. It's kind of like a black light. Come here and take a look. Here we use a special filter to take a picture of the oxytocin cells. It's pretty cool, right? Let's take a picture. Now, without moving the slide, we use a different filter. This time, instead of seeing the oxytocin cells, we see a stain that shows us which cells were active. Each one of these dots represents an active cell. Go ahead and take a picture. Now we can use the computer to put the two images together. These oxytocin cells have the activity markers in them, so they were active. These other cells do not have the markers, so they probably were not active. We can see here that oxytocin neurons were very active in mice showing social anxiety behaviors. When we first discovered this, it was a surprise because we thought oxytocin was supposed to reduce anxiety behaviors. After doing more experiments, we learned that how oxytocin affects anxiety depends on which part of the brain it is acting in. This helps us interpret experiments looking at how oxytocin influences human behaviors. Well, that about wraps it up. We're very excited to have you in the lab. It was great meeting you. I think Dr. Trainer is waiting for you in his office. Go ahead and head down there. Hey, welcome back. Come on in. Well, hopefully now you have a better feel for the work that we're doing in the lab. I'm just really excited about this research. I think it's gonna help us understand how oxytocin can affect anxiety in humans. Now undergrads like you can have a really big role in this research. In the beginning, you're mostly gonna learn from us, but once you have experience, you'll be able to add to the research uh, yourself, maybe even help us change the direction. Do you have any questions? Just give us a minute while we get our screen situated. Thanks, Kristen. All right, so now we're just gonna spend time together answering your questions. Okay, so one question is what courses would you recommend for a transfer student to take in their first quarter? So when you uh, meet with an academic advisor over the summer, which you'll have plenty of um, 
email communication with Letters and Sciences and with us about when that's going to happen, we're actually going to take a look at your transfer credit with you one on one and help to figure out what your first quarter should look like and what your options would be. Um, but definitely we recommend that transfer students take one to two psychology courses um, in their first quarter and for cognitive science students. Um, we recommend that you take at least two major courses um, in your first quarter. Okay. So another question is, could you please talk more about the Transfer Edge program? It's really confusing and I would love to know more about what classes to take as a BS Psych major. Um, Rachel, do you have information about Transfer Edge right now? Oh, we can't hear you. Sorry. <laughs> um, okay. So um, I don't have any information about Transfer Edge right now. It hasn't been made very widely available to advisors yet. Um, but we will take note of this question and answer it separately and we're going, whatever questions we can't answer live, we're going to um, make them available via web afterwards. Because um, we want to make sure that if we can't answer them right now, at least you have access to the answers later. I would like to take classes over the summer at Davis, but can't get a hold of an advisor till after orientation, which should be too late to register. Okay. Um, so I will answer that one too. Um, so if you really want to take some courses through summer session at UC Davis, you don't have to wait until after you have had your orientation appointment with um, your academic advisor. Um, it would be best if you emailed us um, so that you can get uh, like an appointment or a drop in just to talk about what kind of options you have and what your ideas are. Um, so you just need to make it clear in that communication that it's specifically about summer session that you have questions about. If you have questions about fall, we will want to wait until that official orientation meeting with you. <clears throat> just because we really need that transfer credit from you and you don't have that available yet. Okay. <clears throat> Do you have to take specific courses in order to work in a research lab? I'm going to let um, Megan and Daisy give their opinion on this question. If you need specific coursework for the class, is that the question? Um, do you have to take specific courses in order to work in a research lab? Got it. So, no, not for every lab. There are some labs that want you to have a certain background in a certain area, um, but that's definitely not a requirement for every lab. Um, it just depends on the lab that you're interested in, and you can find more information on our website. Um, if you go to the different research labs or even just look at the different faculties lab websites, that will give you a good insight into what they're looking for in research assistants. Um. Um, I would only add, um, if it's certain labs that you want to join, I would probably recommend taking courses related to the lab only so then you can have a better understanding and you can probably meet the um, lab coordinator or the professor through it. And then it will be like easier to like uh, join the lab. Um, and it also is like down to like what type of skill sets you have. Like for some of them, they ask if you like have worked in the lab before or have just certain skills that you've used for jobs before and stuff like that. Uh, so yeah, but not really you have to take necessary classes. It's more like if you're interested, show your interest and the professors will be willing to let you join the lab. Okay. And then um, again for Kristen, Daisy, or Megan, how large are typical upper division courses? Like how many students? Yeah. Oh, um, uh, 
um, first, like intro course of like, let's say you take a one on one class, like for biology, like psych bio, then there's like a lot of people. Um, but I've taken some courses, like a developmental course, where it's maybe like 20 to 30 people, even within my sociology courses, upper division, there's like 20 people, it really depends on like how popular the class is. Like, for example, uh, we have an abnormal site class. It's very popular with students. And that one I have like around, like, I don't even know. There, there's a lot of students taking that class right now, this spring quarter. There's a bunch of students taking that class. But then I have another uh, site class I've taken like last quarter, very tiny, very, very tiny. So it really depends on popularity um, and just like if students are really interested in it. So it's kind of random, I want to say. Even our largest classes that Davey, Daisy's referring to, <clears throat> usually uh, the largest classes don't exceed 300 or 350. That sounds like a lot, but for very large classes like that, they have discussion sections where you meet again in the week with a TA and it's just a smaller group of 20 to 40 people out of the 300 so that you're reiterating some of the information from the lecture in a smaller group. So even if it is a really large class, there is a way to receive that information in a smaller group. Megan, do you have anything to add? Honestly, no, I think that sums it up pretty well. Okay. Let's see. If I was admitted as psychology major, how hard is it to switch to a BS track? Kristen, do you want to answer this one? Sure. Uh, could you repeat the question? If I was admitted as a psych BA, how hard is it to switch to a BS? Um, honestly, that would depend a lot on how much um, science coursework you have completed from um, your previous institution. So let's say um, you haven't done a lot of the bio or the chemistry or the math, um, then it might be a bit harder and you would predict to stay a bit longer than the two years um, you expected to stay at Davis. Um, but if a Bachelor of Science is what you want to do, then um, we will help you plan that um, plan that out and you would just have to come see us at advising when um, more information comes in about your transfer credits and stuff but if you know um, for a fact that a bachelor of science is what you want to do it uh, it would be good to plan ahead to see if you have the necessary classes Are there internship programs offered under the psych major or department? We have uh, the ability for students to gain an internship on their own and then earn credits or units towards their major when it's related to psychology. So we don't have a program where students get placed into an internship. Um, we don't have anything like that yet but we do have the a way for students to get credit for an internship that they got on their own so for example if you got an internship on your own working for or as a like a county court advocate for youth um, then you would get touch get in touch with us and advising and we would help you with the paperwork in order to get one to three or four units for the time that you spent in that internship. Okay. When does registration open? Will transfer students be able to get to easily get spots in classes? So for registration, you will be getting a lot of communication from letters and sciences about that. Um, and so this summer, the university is launching a brand new way to approach orientation where it's virtual and online and people are registering from home. 
And so you're not going to be alone and you're going to have a ton of resources and you're going to have people who are just one click away to be able to help you in some way, um, whether it's the College of Letters and Sciences or us. Um, so just please stay tuned and pay attention to your email for more information about that. What kinds of cognitive science related research is happening at UC Davis and can undergrad students get involved? I'll let other panelists address that if they want first. And I am pulling up a website to read you some names of labs. So cognitive science shares a lot of labs with psychology because they're neuroscience type of labs that cross the line into both departments or both areas. And I went to the psychology website, psychology.ucdavis.edu. I went to the research tab and clicked on research labs. And there's a long list. So I'm just gonna give a few examples. Brain and Social Cognition Lab. The lab in the, web, in the video that we showed you was the Behavioral Neuroendocrinology Lab, which is studying hormones in the brain. Cognition in Context Lab. Cognitive Neuroscience of Language Lab. So how does language work in the brain? The Dynamic Memory Lab. The Human Memory Lab. Infant Cognition Lab. So those are just a few, um, and we actually have dozens and dozens, so you can feel free to explore that website on your own. As a cognitive science major, I would love to participate in research of ASD and other neurodevelopmental disorders. Do undergrads have the opportunity to participate in the MIND Institute? Um, do either of you work over at the MIND Institute? Megan, Daisy, no? Um, so we have plenty of students in psych and cognitive science who are working as research assistants over at the MIND Institute because a lot of the psychiatry faculty over there are associated and affiliated with the undergraduate um, psychology and cognitive science departments here. So those opportunities definitely come up quarter by quarter, so you just have to pay attention. Okay. How many hours should we dedicate to internships and research? Um, so I'm going to let Megan and Daisy um, try to answer from their perspective first. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it honestly totally depends. I know that there are students who work in a research lab for three hours a week. And then I also know people who work upward of 12 hours a week. So it kind of depends on what you're willing to put in and also what the lab expects of you to put in. Um, and then internships are kind of the same way. Um, personally, when I was doing research, I worked about no, six to nine hours a week. And um, that was totally doable with a job, with other activities I was involved in. Um, so it's kind of something that's gonna be personal to you and you'll figure out once you um, kind of do it, but just make sure you understand the, what the lab wants of you or the internship expects of you um, time-wise each week. My experience is a little different only because I'm interested more in like 
the policy aspect because I'm leaning a bit more towards sociology, but I can use my psych um, degree towards it. So I am doing research with a professor in the political department um, area. And how we structured our meetings uh, was that I would meet him uh, two days every week for the, during the winter quarter, uh, where we would go over our ideas about what type of research I'm going to be doing, um, the literature I need to read, um, how to start coding and um, interpret the data that we have. Um, and that was something that we set up by ourselves. He doesn't have like a research group uh, since I personally went to him. Um, but it, like Megan said, it really depends on kind of what the lab manager or even like the research mentor that you have uh, kind of sets out for you both to come together to conclude on how many hours you should work together. Um, and it can be flexible at times only because they do understand that you have like work, um, maybe like outside of school or, um, you know, your own homework and stuff like that. So, um, and sometimes they even list it when you try to apply for a, a lab position, uh, how many hours you are going to be expected to work um, and what they um, expect from you and stuff like that. So yeah, it, it does really depend on, on each lab and research mentor. Okay, so a related, somebody asked, how are the research opportunities? Um, and while I do want Megan and Daisy's input, I do want to start just by saying that um, research looks a lot different depending on the lab that you're in. So if you are in a biological psychology lab working with biological specimens, um, then what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis uh, could be more of a traditional science lab type of work that you might already have envisioned for lab work where like in the video that we showed, you're working with specimen, looking under a microscope, trying to see cells, things like that. But there's also a lot of labs that are dealing with understanding human behavior. So you're observing children and infants and adults, and you're trying to capture a behavior so that it can be studied later in a lab type of setting. And that studying of the behavior could be a lot of coding information in computer programs or trying to group the information, trying to figure out what are the trends that you're seeing from your observations. Um, Megan and Daisy, can you share more about what is the actual work that you do? Yeah, um, I can go ahead. I, I worked actually in a lab in the human development department. Um, I worked there for about for three years and I was coding videos of children in um, free play for their social behaviors interact and interactions with one another. So I was really just looking at the videos that were already taken um, and just coding them for the social behaviors. So it was a lot of work kind of by myself at my computer um, and things like that. Um, but that was kind of my experience. And then there was also someone that asked, is it hard to get a lab position? So I, I kind of thought I would tackle that too. Um, there are so many lab positions and it can be challenging, especially if you're not finding one right away. Um, but don't be discouraged because there are so many options and there is time for you to si find something that you're passionate about. And from my experience, professors really can tell when you're excited about something or not. Um, so just find something you're interested in and stick with that. It can definitely be hard, but um, don't let it discourage you. I do um, just oh. point out that as transfer students, it's totally okay to begin looking for research opportunities when you get here in the fall or in the winter, because we do understand and so do the faculty that your time is a little more limited than people who are coming in as incoming freshmen. Go ahead, Daisy. Oh, okay. Um, so I have two different uh, research experiences. The first one, um, I was actually part of a, a course in sociology where um, my professor allowed us to, to kind of help her with her research, um, where we focused on um, DACA students 
and their feelings uh, with uh, DACA being uh, repelled um, through the Trump administration um, and how different uh, they are feeling or what they're going through versus when it was under the Obama administration. So what she asked of us was to find um, interviewees who have either uh, worked in programs with DACA, uh, who have DACA, or um, have been affected um, by DACA with other family members. And so what I did was I conducted an interview um, An interview that we would talk about and we would get together with our classmates and see uh, what patterns were very reoccurring like um, well for some students their interview a lot about family or a lot about financial problems and so we would um, underline them and then code them and then see how relevant um, in in, the, in response to what's going on with DACA and stuff like that so I worked with um interviews and with surveys for my current research. Um, uh, we did a research through what's called Qualtrics and UC Davis. Um, and although my uh, research mentor has already done the research himself, he let me code it um, and look through the data through like the graphs that he's designed and interpret the data. Uh, so that's what I do. I do a lot of, um, I look at, I do interviews um, and you still do coding. Um, and we usually use Stata or R, but that's something that you get to learn about like as you go on, either through your professors or through courses that you take. All right, thanks. We have about 13 minutes left, so we'll do our best to try to get to more of your questions. I see a question here about being able to study abroad in psychology, um, and that is most definitely an option. Um, so we've spent a lot of time and energy in psychology and cognitive science trying to make study abroad a possibility for students. And so with early planning, with academic advising, then it's something that you might be able to do. So it's just a matter of talking early and planning early with us about it. Um, why do cognitive science students choose to be Aggies instead of going to other UC campuses? Um, so while I can't really speak to how cognitive science is at other UC campuses, I'm just not as familiar. Um, one really cool thing about cognitive science at UC Davis is how interdisciplinary it is and how engaged our cognitive science faculty are um, and excited about it in general. Um, so again, those disciplines are psychology and philosophy, computer science, neuroscience, and linguistics. And so our faculty in those areas work together to deliver um, exciting courses for cognitive science students. Is there anything else people wanna add about that question? Okay. Is counseling via Zoom offered during summer once we accept the admission offer? When is it a good idea to make an appointment to go over classes with the counselor? Um, so your very first initial meeting with us will be via Zoom, but that will be um, like an official one-on-one -on -one with you specifically for orientation and your registration in the summer. So again, I just urge you to stay tuned about or for more information about that via email from Letters and Sciences and from us. So probably later in um, like June and July is when a lot of that is going to be happening. Do cognitive science majors double major often? How difficult would this be? Um, so I'm going to let um, Daisy and Kristen handle this because they have double majors. And not just cog side, but psych too. We might as well answer it for both. Um, generally, uh, when it comes to majors, you are able to double major. Um, it really depends, though, on for 
some emphases within the majors. Like for Psych BA, it's very flexible to do another major only because you don't get so many um, units completed. So you will have to fill in the gaps with either double major, doing a minor, or just taking additional classes. When it comes to um, emphases in the BS, that's where it gets a little tri tricky only because you do take a lot more biological um, or like math or um, physics or any other type of courses you need to complete the emphasis. But you're still able to double major or do minor if that's something that you wish to do. Um, only if you feel like it will help you towards your career related goals or it's just an interest that you really have, uh, we will totally be, uh, recommend doing a double major or minor. If that's something that you really want to do, we'll, we'll help you. Yeah, and um, to build off of that, um, I did a Bachelor of Arts and Sciences. So um, with a Bachelor of Arts and a Bachelor of Science, um, each one of those have their own different requirements on top of your major requirements. So you do have to keep track of a lot of the things on top of um, not just your major classes. But um, if you do come to advising, we can help you um, plan out what it is you want to do. And like Daisy said, if you were to pair uh, two Bachelor of Arts together, um, as a transfer student, I think uh, it's still very um, plausible to do that within the two years. Or if, if you don't end up double majoring, there is always the option to do a, a, your major and a minor, um, if time permits. It just depends on how long you're willing to stay at Davis and what your goals are in the future. And, um, we can talk more about that as you um, keep going with advising in the future. Okay, thanks. Um, this is a quick one. Someone's wanting to know if summer courses are available online. Generally, UC Davis does not offer a lot of online classes, but due to current circumstances with the quarantine, our entire summer sessions will be offered through virtual instruction. Um, so you can head to summer.ucdavis.edu for more information about um, how much summer session might cost for you and um, getting registered. Okay. Um, so someone is asking about um, a possible emphasis in animal behavior. Um, while that is not something that we have through psychology, we just have a biological emphasis, um, the general emphasis, and quantitative. We do have an animal science minor at UC Davis, and so a student could, you know, in very simple way, just declare an animal science minor and pair it with the psychology major. If the student asking this question is um, preparing for veterinary school, then we do have a separate office on campus solely dedicated to advising students who are preparing for a health field. And that's the Health Professions Advising Office. What is the departmental relationship between cognitive science and psychology? How connected are they at UC Davis? Um, so I don't know if you guys can see the little sunshine behind me right here, but basically cognitive science and psychology are um, two prongs of the same um, area of advising. So we advise for psychology and cognitive science as well as a couple other majors a lot of the cognitive science faculty are actually dual faculty in the psychology area and we share a lot of the same resources and research so i would say they're very closely related and overlapping Can we have some tips on how to more effectively, how to be more effective to learn psychology in the UC? Is there a big difference between 
college, like I'm assuming community college and the UC. Um, so I'm gonna put Daisy on the spot here because you are a transfer student and have you share some of the big differences in learning between your community college experience and UC Davis? Um, so the thing that stuck out to me when I first came in was that um, it's just a lot more faster. So it's kind of like taking summer courses at a community college like that, but a bit more is how the pace is at UC Davis or in any UC in general. Um, and since the campus is, I haven't been to a big campus before, so for me, it was very confusing uh, what courses, uh, like, were they in the buildings? Um, but once you start becoming more comfortable as a psych student, you start to realize which buildings are the main buildings that you have your um, site classes at. Um, and so it'll just be a lot easier to recognize like, oh, okay, I just gotta go here. I've been here like a bunch of times. Um, uh, but in general, it's still basically the same. It's just a, a bit more faster. Um, the workload is, a, I wanna say about the same. Um, it's just pace and, and making sure that you are good in organizing your time, especially now if you want to start doing a lot of research. Um, and and maybe clubs and anything else that you want to do. Um, you just have to be a lot more organized with your time at Davis. Um, so that way you get to do as much as you can, but at the same time, just top of your classes. Thanks, Daisy. All right, here's one that's more about engaging with other students. Is it possible to connect with some of the students here? It looks like many of us share the same interests that might be helpful in sharing information. Will any Zooms upcoming focus on breakout sessions or meet and greets? Um, and so I think Letters and Sciences on their website has a schedule of all of their upcoming Zooms. Um, and so if there's nothing else on that list that seems like it meets those needs, then orientation is going to be a really engaging process and that will be later in September. Um, there's a lot happening in the fall quarter that is really geared towards helping you to transition to the community at UC Davis and get you engaged. So while there may not seem to be a lot for you right now in terms of meeting people on Zoom and stuff like that, there will be a lot going on for you in the fall, whether it's going to be in person or virtual, we're not sure. In the meantime, there's always social media outlets where there's a lot of students who are already connecting with the incoming students. Is there anything that other panelists would like to add about that? Um, I think folks usually um, do set up some Facebook groups along um, along the way, though those are unofficial and um, are open to the public, so um, discretion. But um, you will meet a lot of, like what Stacy said, um, you will have the opportunity to connect with a lot of your peers later on in the fall. Okay, so that's all the time that we have during this scheduled webinar. Um, all of the remaining questions that are um, left that didn't feel were answered, that's okay because we're going to copy them down and we're going to write out some answers and share them with, uh, with you all. So. Stay tuned for that. Thank you so much for joining us and we're looking forward to meeting you virtually over the summer. Thank you. All right. So we're not gonna leave yet because we're going to copy these questions. Kristen, is that something you're doing? I believe Daisy might be doing that. Um, so I took screenshots of someone, some at the bottom, but then um, it kept moving too fast, <laughs> so I had to take photos of them, so I took photos of most of them. Okay. Mm.
Um, do you want me to select them or do you want me to send them? Uh, so are you feeling okay for us to close down the webinar and for these questions to go away? Easy. Oh, me in general? Oh, okay. Uh, let me just look at the, should I take the photos from the ones at the top or not really? Because I took most of the, I took, um, I stopped like at, what's the last question I did? I took some screenshots up at the top too, if we need those. Okay. Yeah, then I think we're fine if um, Megan got screenshots at the top. I, I got most from the bottom and I went pretty far up. Cool. Okay. All right. Goodbye for real. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>